And there we go. So when we have, um, ah, there they are. I knew they'd show up. What's going on, man? How you doing? How's life in Brazil? <laughs> we have, um, like I said, I want to talk about the monsters. We're coming up on, um, you know, that changing of the season, the transitions, the uh, winter nights is coming up soon. Um, I think that's a couple weekends from now. It'll be in the Poconos for the AFA, and I'm sure there'll be hundreds, if not thousands, of little celebrations all over the world. This um, this celebration of the death of life, this transition, uh, and and we it ended up being Halloween and giving out candy and all this stuff. <laughs> it's one of those transitions that I was talking about when we have to figure out how to negotiate. Um, where we're, how we're moving each other forward. Uh, I'm, I'm really becoming more and more convinced when we look at people that come into the AFA and some other organizations and, and other small kindreds, it's people that are trying to figure out how to move forward in the world. They're, they're, they've got enough of a common thought process that they are, what's up Dante? that they find some kind of commonality that supports and reinforces each other. But there's always a threat to that. There's always outside influences that would be more than willing to destroy any success a group might have. And I think as, you know, the wild hunt, so much of the wild hunt is an effort to rid the world of that kind of nonsense. That was kind of poisonous thoughts and ideas that, that rob from men the ability to work together. That's one of the three all-powerful female Jotuns that enter the golden age of Asgard, the, the cross thief, the horse thief, that actual theft of teamwork between man and animal and man and man. <laughs> when we read the poetic and the prose, so much of it is so dry. And after a couple of stanzas, you're looking at it and then the words all kind of run together and so on and so forth and they and thou and they, and we, 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 we gloss over or we miss or we see just the most dynamic images that, that spring to mind. <laughs> so there are, tonight I'm gonna to talk about the monsters because they represent very, very real, very powerful images that, that threaten what we wanna do and what we wanna become. We start with Tyr because Tyr is a very important part of this. Now, Tyr is, Tyr is a unique deity because he is one of the individuals who goes to secure the mile-wide cauldron to brew that mead at Eager's Feast, that cauldron that sates the god's thirst. And when you're using a cauldron, he has to go to his father, who is one of those boorish type of individuals that will continually berate their children uh, so that they never get beyond them. It's always a negative, it's always ugly, it's always bad, the other shoe's gonna drop. Um, I've counseled a lot of people that deal with that kind of stuff. Tyr takes the warder of men in Thor. And that's, that's kind of an interesting dynamic when you, when you think about it. <laughs> this, this very powerful deity in his own right, who has moved beyond the limitations he was taught to become something more, tear valiant, that very brave, stout of heart, valorous individual, more than willing to stand up and take one for the team to do that which is right. It says that yet remains that one of the Aesir who is called Tyr, he is most daring and best in stoutness of heart. He has much authority over victory in battle. <laughs> now that's that says a lot about Tyr. He is most daring. He is best in stoutness of heart. That is courage. That is not abs absence of fear. That's action in the face of fear. That is a stoutness of heart. Because I, you can be in all kinds of situations, and I assure you there are some scary situations in the world. You can walk out your front door and end up in one. But Tyr is the one that has much, he has the authority over victory in battle not only because of his physical prowess, but because he also had the courage to stand up with the support of the warder of men in Thor to his parents and secure his heritage that he might share it with everyone. There's an important lesson in that. When we secure these powerful ideas of who and what we are, and we do so with the assistance of divine inspiration or whatever you want to call it, 
so that we can share it for each other, that takes a lot of confidence. Because when you look at Suttinger and his mead, he simply wants to possess that mead. He's not going to share it. He wants to hold it. Now, he's the guy that owns the mead. He makes him important. <laughs> but when you see a truly courageous individual that's handled some of the difficulties of who they are, who has grown through some of the conditioning that they were raised with, who has moved beyond the limitations society might ever impose upon them, he is handicapped. He is missing a limb. To be so confident in who he is that he takes his greatest gift, his heritage, that mile white cauldron, and allows everyone in his tribe to use it. That means something. That is a very powerful indicator of what it means to be stout of heart. Because when, you're, when you have that stoutness of heart, when you have authority over victory, now all of a sudden you're not afraid of becoming less than someone else because you're allowing someone else to do better than you. That kind of confidence is not spoken about very often. We have this heyday of competition among academics so for physical prowess, for spirituality, for all of these other things. We're all trying to move forward. We're all trying to do better. And yet we have this very powerful deity in tier saying, you know what? I'm pretty confident in who I am. All of you can have it. Odin does the same thing with the mead of inspiration. He shares that mead with everyone in that community. Tyr provides the tools that they may do so. <coughs> it is a proverb that he is Tyr valiant who surpasses other men and does not waver. He is wise, so it is also said that he is wisest, is Tyr prudent. So he doesn't rush in leading with the chin. He doesn't run in expecting some kind of special consideration simply because he's Tyr. There are things he's done that has earned him a place that has helped him develop his confidence and become something more. He's been valiant. He surpasses other men and he does not waver. When you know what your limitations are, when you've pushed yourself to the boundaries of who and what you think you can do, uh, the military is a fine place for that. You know, you, you're going to find out what your limitations are. Um, climbing towers, that's another place. You're going to find out if you can make it to the top of that tower and work for all day, be it a 1500 foot tower or a hundred foot tower. Uh, running a race, you're going to find you getting in the ring with somebody to to duke it out, to to compete at a professional level or an amateur level in, in any kind of the martial arts. <laughs> Those men understand what their limits are. And I find typically that, that men like that in those kinds of occupations that have proven themselves with their physical capabilities, they're never really concerned that someone else might be better than them. They're going to enjoy it as a challenge. They're not going to waver, but they're also not going to lead with the chin. The tear prudent, that wisdom that comes with being an accomplished individual doesn't mean that I throw something out there that so, has so much baggage that I have to front load my message with all kinds of education and understanding. And you got to understand the, the decline of Western civilization. And this symbol really means this. And it was taken from here. And there's going to be this and that. And <laughs> If I front load anything that I say with an idea that has, that requires a huge amount of preconceived understanding or unlearning old ideals and lead with the chim and expect everyone to think that I know something because, well, I know a little bit more than you. That's leading with the chin. That's sticking that chin right out there so they can pop it and knock you clean out. <laughs> I see a lot of people do that. People come in, we find some kind of idea or some kind of concept that makes us feel like our eyes have opened. We see a new horizon. We understand some kind of concept that maybe not everybody's working on our behalf in this world. And now all of a sudden we begin to talk about it loudly. We used to talk about Antifa, talking about uh, liberal Democrats or conservatives or fascists or communists or socialists. Um, and there's a message that goes with each one of those terms. And each time I said one of those terms, there were a lot of preconceived notions that go off in people's minds about what they mean. Do I want to lead with the chin by bringing in one of them terms so that I might teach you to be, I don't know what, something, something akin to what I think. <laughs> there's a real desire to be right. And when people start reading all this stuff and they start seeing all this stuff, they're going to do their best to convince you of how right they are. If we're leading with the chin, we're shooting ourselves in the foot. We're going to get knocked out. We're going to get taken out of the game. And society is going to 
take us, put a little label on us, and put us right there up on a shelf so they can neatly ignore us. And that's what happens. So <laughs> when I'm looking at tear, all of a sudden now I'm seeing an individual who understands his limits. He's got enough wisdom to know not to lead with the chimp. And he is one token of his daring is that he enticed the Fenris wolf to take upon that fetter of Gleipnir. The wolf did not believe them that they would cut him loose until they laid Tyr's hand in his mouth as a pledge. <laughs> the only other problem I have with Tyr, and it's not with him, it's with the people that want to call upon him in legal matters. It blows my mind. Tyr is one handed, so there's his handicap, and is not called a reconciler of men. Okay, that's. Right there. Individuals that are confident in who they are, that have gone that way, that have gone the way of the martial artist or the warrior, they're not necessarily interested in making peace. Their primary concern is combat, is victory, is, is, is accepting that challenge, is becoming something more. When you want to win in a battle, or when in legal matter, you call for SETI. That is the best seat of judgment among gods and men. Thus it is said here, Hall is called Glittner with gold tis pillared and with silver thatched the same. Therefore SETI bides the full day through and puts to sleep all suits. So there's two real different areas there that I, people get confused. Now, if we're getting confused at the very basic ideas of this, and people say, well, I'm going to do it the way I want to do it. Well, that's fine. You can do it the way you want to do it. <laughs> but shouldn't we at some point begin to take a little bit of a heed of this and see the real distinct separations of the aspects of the individual and what that might mean for the individual? Or should we continue to make it up as we go along because, well, that sounds cooler. <laughs> so when we look at all that, we have to kind of get that in some kind of, we have to reconcile that in some manner in our minds. Because as we go down here, we see these children of Loki and Anger Boda. Now, all of these other beings and deities are expressions of the highest order of life. That energy of life that as water expresses itself, as it becomes a conduit for spiritual energy, as it becomes a conduit for electrical currents and, and heat and all of these other things that we see as animated living beings. <laughs> Those individuals are all fully incorporated into that. They're confident in who they are. They share with each other. They are not st stingy about it. They're building each other up. They're moving each other forward. They're helping each other create paths that might be wildly divergent, but they are distinct. When we confuse them, we kind of lose the ability to differentiate what part we need to develop in what situation. So when it comes to these monsters, when it says yet more children had Loki, Anger Boda was the name of a certain giantess in Jotunheim with whom Loki begot gat three children. <coughs> Why would he do that? So he has a girlfriend in Sigyn and he has two other sons, one of whom's guts were used to bind him. But he spins out a little bit. When you see individuals, a tribe, a group of individuals who are cultivating the best of who and what they are by incorporating themselves into the world around them and all of these wonderful ideas and building each other up, the order of heaven, the order of men, that idea of justice in a free society, the cultivation of a proud, strong warrior's heart, the ideas of beauty, the ideas of abundance, the ideas of strength and wisdom. When those are being cultivated as the finest expressions of life, as we see in Asgard amongst the Aesir and the Aesir, and then you see one individual who, I'm going to go over here and I'm going to do it better. Anytime we begin to create an identity of who we are by concepts of being separate from, we create pain for ourselves. And we create those concepts and ideas that will bring a lot of pain and ruin into our own world. And this is what Loki is doing 
as he drifts off into Jotunheim with Anger Boda. He is creating a, a separate, he's creating an identity of himself as separate from a group of individuals who have already allowed him a seat at the table. See, he thinks he can do what Odin has done without making the sacrifices of self necessary to achieve the high seat that Odin sits in. So he sneaks off over there. He creates an identity of himself, which is separate from the very con core concepts of what the Aesir and Aesir are trying to do in Asgard and the Vanir. <laughs> and he creates three things. One of these is incorrect. The first one is the Fenris Wolf, that great devourer of all things. The second is Jormungandr, that is the Midgard Serpent. And the third, they said, was hell. But when the gods learned that this kindred was nourished in Jotunheim, and when the gods perceived by prophecy that from this kindred great misfortune should befall them, and since it seemed to all that there was a great prospect of ill, first from the mother's blood, and yet worse from the father's, then all fathers sent gods thither to take the children and bring them to him. When they came to him, straight away he cast the serpent into the deep sea, where he lies about all the land, and this serpent grew so greatly that he lies in the midst of the ocean, encompassing all the land, and bites upon his own tail. That is the Ouroboros. And if you're not sure what the Ouroboros is, allow me to shed some light upon this. The Ouroboros is an ancient symbol depicting a serpent or dragon eating its own tail, originating, well, this Wikipedia article says it originates in ancient Egyptian icono iconography. iconography. <laughs> the Ouroboros entered Western tradition via Greek magical tradition and was adopted as a symbol in Gnosticism and Hermeticism and most notably in alchemy. Now, that's probably the most popular part. But since we don't know how old these, these, this oral tradition that we're reading is, we don't know how old this concept is. The snake that is constantly devouring itself. In ancient Egypt, it first appears in the enigmatic, enigmatic Book of the Netherworld, an ancient Egyptian funerary text in the tomb of Tutankhamun in the 14th century BC. So that's uh, it's been around for a minute. This concept of a snake constantly devouring itself, constantly growing, constantly changing, constantly evolving, constantly becoming something more by devouring, getting rid of those ideas that are not necessary to building itself into something more. <laughs> he carried on to alchemy and Gnosticism, the, the yin and the yang, it's a constant balance, it's a constant growth. But the Jungian idea on it is one that caught my eye. The um, Jung saw the Ouroboros as an archetype and the basic mandala of alchemy. Jung also defined the relationship of the Ouroboros, Ouroboros to alchemy. <coughs> so that's taking one thing and turning it into another. Now all of the Aesir are doing that. They're taking one thing and turning it into another in a positive mindset. They're taking themselves and they're developing, they are divesting themselves of those thoughts or concepts or um, preconceived notions that are hindering them from moving forward into something better. Loki does not know how to do that. He simply creates this great self-devouring beast. And it, it kind of ties back into what I said last week about suicide. When you talk to a classroom of people who's thought about suicide and everybody raises their hands, we don't know which part of us needs to die like Odin hanging on the tree so that we might move forward, keep on walking across the bridge. The Ouroboros is just devouring it all. <coughs> the alchemists who in their own way knew more about the nature of the individuation process than we moderns do express this paradox through the symbol of the Ouroboros, the snake that eats its own tail. The Ouroboros is said to have been, have a meaning of infinity or wholeness. In the age-old image of the Ouroboros lies the thought of devouring oneself and turning oneself into a circulatory process, the cycle, 
all of this as a cycle that we instead of that linear tradition that we all kind of grew up with now all of a sudden we're being faced with something that keeps going around and around and around <coughs> For it was more clear to the astute alchemist that the prima materia of the art was man himself. So now we've got uh, Odin has taken this child of the egotistical, arrogant, self-indulging individual who's trying to create something without, without sacrificing and let it encircle the world. And it becomes the bane of the warder of men's existence. So this is Thor's great challenge, this warder of men. He is the God for the common man. He's the God that helps us keep putting one foot in front of the other when times are toughest. Perhaps he's the one that's helping us figure out which part of ourselves we need to divest so that we might continue to become something more, something to become something greater. <laughs> the two end up destroying each other at the end of all things before the cycle starts anew. The feedback process is at the same time a symbol of immortality, since it is said that the Ouroboros that he slays himself and brings himself to life, fertilizes himself and gives birth to himself. He symbolizes the one who proceeds from the clash of opposites, and therefore he constitutes the secret of the prima materia which unquestionably, unquestionably stems from man's unconscious. And I can think of few more apt descriptions of Odin's sacrifice to himself than that right there. So all of a sudden, when we're looking at just that first line of the first monster of the egotistical man, what he brings into the world, we find an opportunity to, to develop from it. That kind of pain results in growth. All pain is training. All kind of growth is development. We're getting rid of something old to become something new. We're using those old thoughts to fertilize uh, new passions, new loves, new ideas. Just as Odin punctured himself on the tree and killed that part of himself that caused him to lose his temper and lose his throne, then he is reborn with new energy, new inspiration, new tools with which to become something better. He takes the Midgard serpent, Jormungandr, and casts it so it circles the world and sets the warder of men against it. So as regular average people, we've got imagery here that kind of gives us an indication of what's going on with the cyclical nature of our lives. And after you get on in years a little bit, I, be, I began to see patterns that I did again and again and again. Patterns of success and failure, patterns of, of love and hate, patterns of um, growth and failure. <laughs> it is with the greatest or the, mo or the utmost of, of struggles with my own thought process that's allowed me to change my thought process to stop that cyclical pattern and begin a different one at maybe a little bit better level, maybe a little bit more worthy of who I am, my name. And maybe it helps me move forward towards the ideas, the concepts that I see these gods and goddesses doing in Asgard. They are all doing this process of growth by the Ouroboros. The Midgard Serpent is that very real challenge in our own lives that we call upon the warder of men and Thor to help us deal with. Now it may destroy that God, but it may also very well be as in the Rig Thula where Rig stepped from the brush and called, called um, Jarl his own when he learned the use of the runes and then Jarl became Rig himself. Think about that because that's also a possibility with us. We have no idea what's going to happen when we cross through that doorway. We're all trying to escort each other as safely as we can with as much strength as we can towards that final doorway, that final destination of death. <laughs> Are we using these ideas of Thor as the warder of men to defeat the Midgard Serpent to help us defeat those prospects of ourselves? Because very few people are going to go out there and stick themselves to a tree. The ones that do, they usually end up losing it all. They kill the entire being and still the part of the being that needs to die so that the best part of who we are gets to move forward. 
So there's, there's a world of thought and strength and growth in that real simple little short idea there. Now, the second one, or the third one is hell. Um, hell he cast into Niflheim and gave to her power over nine worlds. That's a hell of a thing, ain't it? So he takes this daughter of the egotistical men, they call it something new, and they make it threatening. Now, all of a sudden, death is not a beautiful transition of rebirth. Now, all of a sudden, it's a failure. Now, all of a sudden, it's the end. That right there is the Christianization of our Lord. Where our, where the con- cyclical concept of our lives, of our afterlife, of what we become after all that, now all of a sudden it's become a dark and scary place, except for a select few. But she has power over the nine worlds, so that means everybody. She apportions all abodes among those that were sent to her, that is, men dead of sickness or of old age. It does not say that a straw death is a bad thing. It does not say that all of a sudden it's a bad place to be because for tens of thousands of years, hell handled the doorway that provided, that opened. So we saw the torch of all of our ancestors. No, it's that torch of inspiration that every ancestor holds to provide us kind of a signpost or a light to guide the way that source of inspiration. But in that first line right there, all of a sudden it becomes scary. Whereas it didn't used to be Uta City or Uta Sitta or sitting on the grave mounds to get that inspiration from the ancestors didn't used to be a scary thing. Now we're terrified to go in a graveyard. Death has become vilified. She has great possessions there. Her walls are exceeding high and her gates great. This is where we begin to get the scary part of dying. Her hall is called sleek cold, her dish hunger, famine is her knife, idler her thrall, sloven her maidservant, pit of stumbling her threshold, by which one enters, disease her bed, gleaming bale her bed hangings. She is half blue black and half flesh colored, by which she is easy to recognize, and very lowering and fierce. Now, if you're one of those individuals that hasn't been able to understand or comprehend or deal with what aspect of yourself you need to get rid of and operate entirely out of an egotistical mindset, such as Loki drifting off of Jotunheim to have a fling with some troll in the, in the jungle or, or the woods, <laughs> what kind of a bow do you think you'd be allocated? Because the processes of growth that control our processes of thought have not manifested to the best of their ability, we have not cultivated those gifts that we've been given. Now all of a sudden, we might really be seeing something much different than what our ancestors intended as they hold that torch for us. But doubt's been cast. Now all of a sudden, the validity of this path is cast in doubt because, well, I don't know what's gonna happen next. (laughs) That's the Christianization of 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 our lore. And it's a bad thing. And We'll come out of it. We don't have a very secure, safe uh, comprehension of death. I've heard it best saying death is not failure to taking off of a tight shoe. Um, there's a lot of unlearning we have to do with regards to this concept for us to truly embrace all of the wonderful things that come with also true. We have lived in this internet age and it's easy to find all of the negative stuff to hang about in a pit of stumbling. But we also all of a sudden have access to worlds of ancient knowledge that the church has said, no, you can't look over there. So now it's kind of like we're stumbling those nine steps after we've defeated the Midgard serpent to fall and become something new. As we drift on into winter nights, these are things we should be thinking of. The wolf, though, the Aesir brought up at home, and Tyr alone dared to go and give him meat. So every day he went out there and dealt with that damned animal. 
But when the God saw how much he grew every day, and when all prophecies declared that he was fated to be their destruction, then the Aesir seized upon this way of escape. They made a very strong fetter, which they called Ledinger, and brought it before the wolf, bidding him to try his strength against the fetter. The wolf thought that no overwhelming odds, and let him do it, at, let him do with him as they would. The first time the wolf flashed out against it, the fetter broke, so he was loosed out of Ladinger. After this, the Aesir made a second fetter, stronger by half, half again as much, which they called Dromi, and bade the wolf try that fetter, saying he would become very famous for strength if such huge workmanship would not suffice to hold him. But the wolf thought that this fetter was very strong, and he considered also that the strength had increased in him since the time he broke Ladinger. It came into his mind that he must expose himself to danger if he would become famous. So how many times have we had to consider that we must expose ourselves to danger if we would become famous? What bonds are we going to have to break? What bonds are we going to have to struggle against if we're to become famous? Because I see all of the AC are doing this, struggling against bonds, things that hold them in place to become famous. So he let the fetter be laid upon him. And when the Aesir declared themselves ready, the wolf shook himself, dashed the fetter against the earth and struggled fiercely with it, spurned against it and broke the fetter so that the fragments flew far. So he dashed himself out of Dromi and since then it passed as a proverb to loose out of letting her to dash out of Dromi when anything is exceeding hard. Sometimes life is exceeding hard. Sometimes we got to struggle like that. But I think we, we really need to be considering that without a healthy understanding of the cyclical nature of these things, without a healthy understanding of what these sacrifices of what we are really mean, much of that binding, much of that exceedingly hard struggle is with our own thought process and what we think about ourselves, what we're trying to deal with. The greatest obstacles that have ever occurred in my life are, are obstacles that I created for myself because my thought process was out of line. After that, the Aesir feared that they should never get the wolf bound. And the All-Father sent to him who was called Skirnir. Now, Skirnir, he's been around. He, he gets around. He's, <laughs> he's done a pretty good job. He's, he's, I'll get into him later. This is Freyr's messenger. This is the one that secured the northern lights for the midnight sun. Down to the region of the Black Elves to certain dwarves and caused to be made the fetter named Glyvnir. It was made of six things, the noise a cat makes in footfall, the beard of a woman, the roots of a rock, the sinews of a bear, the breath of a fish, and the spittle of a bird. And though thou understand not these matters already, yet, th yet now thou mayest speedily find certain proof herein that, that no lies told thee. Thou must have seen that a woman has no beard, and no sound comes from the leap of a cat, and there are no roots under a rock. And by my troth, all that I have told thee is equally true, though there may be some things which thou canst not put to the test. So they used all that stuff up to make these things that don't exist. And they used it to bind a wolf. So they took all of these things, used up all the material in the world, and created Gleipnir. Then said Ganglary, this is certainly I can perceive to be true. These things which thou hast taken for proof I can see, but how was the fetter fashioned? Well, Har answered, that I am well able to tell thee. The fetter was soft and smooth as a silken ribbon, but as sure and strong as thou shalt now hear. Then when the fetter was brought to the Aesir, they thanked the messenger well for his errand. Then the Aesir went out upon the lake, called Amsvart near to the island called Lingvi. And summoning the wolf to them, they showed him the silken ribbon and bade him burst it, saying that it was somewhat stouter than appeared from its thickness. And each passed it to the others and tested it with the strength of their hands, and it did not snap. Yet they said the wolf could break it. Then the wolf answered, touching this matter of the ribbon, it seems to me that I shall get no glory out of it. Though I snap asunder so slender a band, but if it be made with cunning and wiles, then, though it seem little, that band shall never come upon my feet. Then the Aesir answered that he could easily snap apart a slight silken band appealing to his vanity and his ego, trapping him into his own thought process, those things he thinks creates his reality. 
then thou wilt not be able to frighten the gods. And then we shall unloose thee. The wolf said, if ye bind me so that I shall not be free again, then you will act in such a way that it will be late ere I receive help from you. I am unwilling that this band should be laid upon me. Yet rather than that, ye should impugn my courage. Let someone of you lay his hand in my mouth for a pledge that this is done in good faith. So it's a tit for tat. It's a Mexican standoff. You want him to tie myself up with my own thought process? Let's have a little, uh, let's have a little offering here. There's going to have to be a sacrifice. And that's what we always miss. We're going to bind ourselves up. There's going to be a sacrifice. We're going to have to get rid of something to get out of it. Each of the Aesir looked at his neighbor, and none was willing to part with his hand until Tyr stretched out his right hand and laid it in the wolf's mouth. But when the wolf flashed out, the fetter became hardened, and the more he struggled against it, the tighter the band was. Then all laughed except Tyr. He lost his hand. When you have an individual who secures the assistance of the warder of men to obtain his heritage, to obtain that family birthright which is his, who struggles against the odds, who is always more than ready and willing to, to accept the challenge of what's in front of him, to share his heritage with those around him, and to sacrifice a part of who he is so that that shared heritage might be safe. You find yourself with a deity who, while he may not be a reconciler of men, he is more than worthy of us to emulate, to respect, to honor, to venerate, as we move forward to secure a future for ourselves. What would we, what would we be willing to sacrifice so that the man next to us might achieve greatness of his own accord? Not according to my determinations, but by what he might think might make him worthy of the heritage he desires. That's courage. That's the kind of thing that I see every day. When you look at all of our soldiers and whether or not they're fighting in a just war is irrelevant. These men are going out there and they're laying their hands and their legs and their limbs and they're leaving them on battlefields halfway across the world. This is the kind of sacrifice that deserves respect. This is the kind of thing that allows us to become something so much more than we could ever become of our own accord. It gives a man hope, that great opiate of the masses, as it were. When we cultivate our friendships, these are the kind of things we need to be thinking about. Would I lay my hand out for this guy? Now I have sons and daughters, be no question. No question asked and not a moment's hesitation. When we start looking at each other to do the same thing, are we front loading our message so much so that it causes us to say, well, maybe not. Because I assure you there's a world of people in the Middle East who will not hesitate to make that sacrifice because of what they believe in. At some point in also true, we're gonna to have to cultivate this to the idea that it is a faith and a way of life and one worth sacrificing for, protecting and cherishing. And we don't need a justification of an academic to justify our radical departure from societal norms. What we need to understand is that amongst the Aesir, there is a love that glues them all together stronger than Gleipnir ever held that wolf. So much so that that greatest of warriors was willing to lay a hand out. So that's my handout for you guys tonight. And I appreciate everyone's attention. And oh, hey, Brenda, my, my sister's on here. I just noticed. <laughs> I um uh, I appreciate everyone joining in tonight and um, next week we'll do something cool. I don't know what I'll be a little bit more prepared. Um, that, that reunion was, it was awesome. <laughs> I'm just going to leave it at that. <laughs>
Does anyone have any questions or anything they'd like to ask or discuss? I'd be happy to take any questions or if not, I'm going to go ahead and end the meeting and uh, I'll get it up. Thanks, Jack. I'm going to get it uploaded uh, soon on YouTube and feel free to enjoy it. Thank you everyone for joining me tonight. Thanks, Dante. It's good to see you guys. Thank you. I like it. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Y'all have a good night. You too. Bye bye. Bye bye. <laughs> <laughs>